We're beginning our, or, say not beginning, continuing our series, Power Up. Uh, today we're going to do what I think is probably the most challenging of the teachings in this series called Power Up with Forgiveness. And uh, I want you to take good notes today because this is definitely something you're going to want to remember, okay? Uh, and let me just say good morning to all of you joining us live. It's a little bit different this morning. If you're in the digital world, we are migrating away from Facebook and moving over to our own website. It's called, uh, the platform that we use is called Church Online. Uh, the reason that we're doing that is Facebook, quite frankly, limits us somewhat. Uh, when we are broadcasting, they censor things that we do and things that we say they consider me a radical. So uh, they, will, they will watch what we say, especially with the video content. They will watch that and, and, and see what that is. So uh, believe it or not, we can actually have a broader audience by moving to our own platform. And so if you go to our Facebook page, there will be links there that will send you but you can go right to our website, so you do c3lafayette.org, and one of the first links right there says something. Todd, what does it say? Watch a message or, yeah, watch live. So you just clink, clink that, click that, and off you, <laughs> off you go, okay? So just wanted you to be aware of that. Here's the thing. We can get anybody. Not everybody has, believe it or not, I know this is hard to believe, but not everybody has a Facebook page, right? But anybody can come to our website. So we think in the long run, that's a better move for us, and we want to actually draw people to our website, so we think that's a better way to go. Plus, they can't cut our material that way, and I hate to say this, but that's the route that Facebook is moving more and more. They are censoring people they don't like, and they don't like Christians. Just want you to know that, and I'm not saying that to be mean or to be political. They just simply don't like what we have to say and what our message is, and we think that ultimately, my ultimate thought is there'll be a day coming when we're no longer allowed there anyway. So we decided, what the heck, let's just make the move. What do you think? Yeah. Let's just, let's just get our own stuff going on. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. All right, part three, power up with forgiveness. If you've got a Bible, if you actually have one, uh, it's uh, Luke chapter 23, but you probably have your phones. So go to Luke 23, beginning at the 32nd verse. And let me just give you context here before I jump in and read this. It's in the middle of a story. It's in the middle of Jesus' crucifixion. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. And of course, we kind of tend to go that way anyway this time of year, don't we? Because what's in April? Easter. So between February, March, April, we will probably say or speak something to the issue of Jesus and his suffering on the cross and, of course, his resurrection. But for today, this is just aimed at the issue of forgiveness. So let's read this together. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals, <laughs> the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, you could have said a lot of things while you're on a cross, but to me, this is probably the most powerful thing or one of the most powerful things that Jesus will ever utter because he's in the middle of being tortured, all right, in, in the most horrible way. And here's what's fascinating about when that statement is recorded by Luke. It's recorded after people have done things to him, and it's recorded before people have done things to him. Because look at what it says as I finish this. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. Imagine that. If he chooses to save himself, then he can't save us, right? Okay, the soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. And I'm going to stop there and I want you to jump over real quick to uh, John chapter 10. I'm not going to say anything about those verses just yet. But John chapter 10, just one verse, verse 18 
And here's what it says, and I want you to understand this. I'm going to put this in context too. No one, this is Jesus speaking, no one can take my life from me. We forget that. Jesus was not a victim, okay? He's in control of the whole process. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. Now, why do I throw that verse in? Because I want you to see that everything Jesus did on the cross then was voluntary. Jesus didn't have to do what he did. But in the middle of being tortured, he ushers that statement, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. So I'm going to give you some points here today. Take them down because it has to do with why we should forgive. And then it also, I want to point out what forgiveness is not so that you understand really what I'm talking about, okay? It's a big issue in the church. Here's point number one. Jesus demonstrates that forgiveness is an act of the will. It was a free choice. He voluntarily laid down his life, so he voluntarily made that statement, something he did not have to do. And let me just ask you this. If somebody were torturing you, Would you voluntarily forgive them, even while they were doing it? Could you do that? It's not an easy proposition, is it? Okay, question, why did Jesus say they don't know what they're doing? This is really important, because they have no idea who he is. And so you may be a victim, so to speak, of somebody hurting you, saying something about you, Maybe even mocking you for your faith. It could be so many different things. But this is one thing you have to try to bear in mind. If they are an unbeliever, don't expect them to be Christ-like at all. Sometimes we will, when we're watching people, especially if we're watching digitally or we're watching, what's that old thing we used to, a TV? (laughs) Anybody use those anymore? No, I'm just kidding. I think I watch more on my phone now than anything. Is anybody else like that? I, I probably do more with my phone than about anything. A little bit computer with my phone. Television is just, I just don't spend that much time in, in that arena. It's more phone and, and more computer. But wherever you are in that universe, man, you just, whew, the things people say and do now. But if you can remember that one thought, you know what they're doing. That's going to help you. Amen? Well, you're not as excited as the first group. So, boy, they stood up on their feet and shouted on that one. Okay? All right. Another point. Jesus knew how to look at a person's need and not just their faults. Can I just say this? That takes a while to learn. Because if someone has hurt you, can you really say you took time to figure out what was causing them to do what they did? Oftentimes, if you understood that, that would help you understand why they said what they said or acted the way that they did. And so, there's not only them not knowing what they're doing, you may not know what their personal need is and why they act up or why they act out. You hear me? You may not understand that. Now, I want you to see this quote, and then we're going to unpack what I just said. How many, anybody here know who June Hun is? No one? My wife does, because I know her, and I talk about her. Uh, June Hunt has a radio call-in show, national radio call show. She's the author of many books. She's probably one of the most practical and insightful counselors in America today. I, I love her stuff. I recommend. In fact, she has a book on forgiveness. You might want to write down the title. I can't remember the title. <laughs> <But if you, laughs> it's called, I think it's called Forgiveness When You Don't Want To, something like that. That may be the exact, but if you just Google June Hunt, it's amongst her many. She's authored many, many books. Um, let me tell you just a snippet of June Hunt's story and how she ended up being a renowned counselor and, and how that point about understanding people's needs was so huge in her life. Uh, June has a, a kind of a bizarre story. It's, it's kind of, as I said, kind of crazy. When she was a little girl, she, uh, 
she had a mom and a couple of siblings. But the man in her life, her dad, was actually married to another woman, and her mother was his mistress. And so this man was leading a double life. That's what he was doing. And and she wasn't fully aware of all this. She didn't find this out right away. But he had six kids and a wife. This man was very powerful, very successful, very wealthy. Okay? It takes a lot of money to afford two families. Just want you to know. Okay? And she said to the outside world, he looked the part. Wore suit and tie every day. Supplied hundreds of jobs in his business ventures. Wealthy. Could buy a lot of things. She goes, and eventually, his wife died. And when his wife died, he married June's mom and moved them all in together. And no sooner had they moved in, and he began to abuse June and her sisters, both physically and emotionally and mentally. And she said he was paranoid. He was 30 years older than June's mom. According to June, June's mom was his trophy wife. Loved to parade her around, but he said he was possessive and controlling, and he immediately tried to create a wedge between mom and the kids. And he would go after the kids anytime he thought maybe they were getting too close to their mother. He would separate them. He would, he would abuse them in all kinds of ways. I won't even go into all that. You can read it in her, in her book. But June says as she got older, she noticed she was changing. The abuse was having an effect of making her bitter and making her angry. How she describes it, and you can see this, we want others to drop their stones, but we are reluctant to drop ours. We love it. We want Jesus to forgive us, don't we? Come on. We say yes and amen. Yes, Jesus, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. But I will just say this, the longer time we spend as Christians, we can forget God's mercy towards us, and we're not so willing to extend it towards others. Come on, isn't it true? Man, it took you so much longer. This is a much more bitter group than the first service. I just want you to know that. Okay? I'm going to say things till I wake you up. I will keep zinging you and poking you till we get this going, all right? Because the Holy Spirit's moving, and he wants you to hear this. I say that with complete confidence. Okay? you got to understand forgiveness, and I'm going to tell you why. If we walk in unforgiveness, you cannot inherit the blessings of God and all that he has for you. He can't bless you the way he wants to. He wants to bless you more than where you are now. But when you hold on to unforgiveness, you can forget it. Because God's a holy God. And I've had to learn this. I just want you to know you're looking at somebody that's had to learn it the hard way. You ever know a person, you ever heard that famous statement, don't get mad, get even? That's me. That's how I was for a lot of years. Not that way now. Michelle's getting better. I'm free, okay? But seriously, uh, in June's life, uh, she said it was like having a bag around her waist. And she goes, think of the flint. Flint is like the hardest rock there is, or one of the hardest. Uh, And she said, it was like every time my father abused me, she was like picking up a rock and putting it in that bag. And she said that bag just kept getting bigger and heavier and fuller until she said, By the time she reached her teen years, she's in a full-blown rage. And by the way, she writes one of the best books in the world on anger. Because, man, she had it. She had anger and she had rage. She saw what was happening to her mother. She saw what was happening to her sisters. She understood what was happening to herself. And here's the thing. She didn't know what to do about it. And then something amazing happened. She got around some young people her age who were Christians. And they began to talk to her about God. She said she never understood the difference between religion and a relationship. She said they saw or she saw that they had a relationship with God and she wanted that in her life. And so she began to go to church. She went to church and she finally accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. But she said my thinking was so messed up. She said I was so logical. She said my background was mathematics. And she said, I came to a very wrong, logical conclusion. And she said, here's how it worked. God hates sin. My father is a sinner. I hate my dad. God hates dad. I should kill him. 
and do us all a favor. So she actually went to her mother, who had also become a Christian, and was growing in her faith, and she said, Mom, I've figured out how to solve our problems. I'll just kill Dad. She was serious. She said, if I get rid of him, I'll get rid of the problem. And she said, I'm so glad for my mother's answer, because I'll never forget it. She said, my mother looked at me and just kind of hugged me and said, Honey, that's okay. You don't need to do that for Mommy. And then this is what she said. Honey, he doesn't know what he's doing. Does that sound familiar? She's like, don't worry about mom. I'll be okay. You'll be okay. Now, here's what's fascinating. Many years later, after her dad had died, she found out he had been abused as a child. And he had carried that forward and had brought that into all those relationships. And so I just want you to know today, you may have this thought in your mind, and I want to, I'm, I'm setting this up here, uh, and I hope you guys are watching at home and paying attention. There's going to be this question that lingers in my mind, but I can't forgive them if you knew what they did. If you, if you just understood what these people did to me or what somebody did to me, I, I can't forgive. So this is what you need to know, and this is what June really teaches. Forgiveness is not a natural response at all. It's a supernatural one. You're going to say, I can't forgive. Remember, Jesus can. And he can help you with that, okay? He's always willing to help you with that. But that's one of the wonderful things you can come to him with. There's nothing wrong with going to him and saying, I can't do it. But I want to. Can you help me? And if somebody at that level of abuse and hatred and rage can be saved and have her heart changed, then our hearts can be changed today. And here's a caution I want to throw out. I experienced this more than once. Don't just walk up to somebody and say, I just want you to know I've forgiven you. You should be asking for it, not just walking up to people and saying, I've forgiven you. Let me give you a perfect example. One time I finished a church service down in Virginia, and a couple walked up to me, and they said those very words. I don't even remember what I was speaking on. And they said, Tom, we want you to know we've forgiven you. And I was kind of like, okay. And then I followed up. I said, could you tell me what I did specifically that I needed forgiveness for? And they said, well, we have a list. <laughs> and she pulled it out of her pocket, unfolded the paper. Number one, we don't like that you wear shorts to church on Sunday. They said, we think that's inappropriate for a pastor. And I looked at her and I said, look, I've got nice legs. If you have a problem with that, <laughs> nothing I can do. <laughs> I didn't use that one in the first service. <laughs> but then she goes, we, uh, we don't like how you look at us. I go, what, 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 do you, what do you mean? She goes, well, you're always doing this thing where you stop and you stare at us and it's like, God's like preaching like right at us and we take it kind of personally. <laughs> of course, I wanted to say, perhaps you're under conviction. <laughs> but, you know, I always try to go back and forth. That's one of the things they teach you in Communications 101 is you, you never stay on, on one person and zero a single person. I don't think I do that. Do I do, I do that? A little bit. A little bit? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> But I said, well, okay, what else? They said, well, we don't like the music. I don't like this contemporary stuff. I was like, and I stopped them at that point. I said, okay. I said, look, if you are feeling that uncomfortable here, I said, there's nobody forcing you to stay here. You can find another church. And then they looked right at me and they go, but we like it. <laughs> and I, I, okay. See you next week. Bring me a new list. <laughs> you know? But here's the thing. Ask for forgiveness. Okay? 
don't just walk up to somebody without any kind of context for that, okay? Now, I always have to have a beach picture this time of year, okay? Forgiveness is not the same. And that, remember I said there would be a couple of things that forgiveness is not. It's not the same as reconciliation. There are two different things. What's the difference? Forgiveness is when you make a choice to forgive somebody, no matter what they've done. Reconciliation is when you actually have the honor and the privilege and the joy of maybe getting together with that other person and being able to come to a moment of forgiveness and peace. Can I just say this and just be honest with you? That's pretty rare in our world today because we stake out our turf. We're right, they're wrong, and as long as you're willing to understand that, we're all good. Can I just say this? I have a great gift, and I want to share it with you. I know how to clear out a counseling session faster than anybody, <laughs> specifically in marital situations, and here's why. A couple will sit down with me, and I ask them the first question. Half the time, we never get to the second one. Want to hear what that secret weapon is? Yep. Are you two both willing to accept that you're both wrong and willing to confess it and willing to deal with it and work on the areas where you've made mistakes? You know, yeah, time's kind of running short. <laughs> Can I tell you, that ends more counseling sessions more than any other thing. So I'm, I'm not joking on that. I wish I, I have to sometimes crack jokes about it because it's kind of sad. I can't get people to move to what you call that middle place of reconciliation. You know, notice I put in a little statement there. You can't always turn back the clock. You wish that you could and maybe go back to the way things were prior to whatever that offense was. Sometimes it's not possible because people sometimes just are human and they're not willing. That's why you have options here. Forgiveness is always that first line. You say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in forgiveness. Jesus chose to. It's not an emotional thing. It's not based on my feelings. It's based upon obedience. Christ did it from the cross in the midst of his pain. He can help us too. Reconciliation, man, if you can get that as part of the process, but you can't always do that. In fact, sometimes that can be dangerous if you to attempt that, depending on what people have done to you. There are some people you just shouldn't go around or near and forgive them. There's those situations in our culture as well. All right, but let's look at 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8, because I want to reinforce this point about forgiveness. Now I'll say it. You guys with me, say amen. amen. Now you're awake. All right. We're going to be out of here and out to lunch before you know it. Now watch this. This is important. And again, can I just say this? You'll never get the points that I've made up till now if you're not willing to invest time in the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Paul, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you don't renew your mind through the Word, you're not going to understand forgiveness. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Did you all at home hear that? You have been given everything you need to live a godly life, which includes forgiveness. But if you don't access his word, you're not accessing his power. And if you're walking in unforgiveness, you can't receive everything that you need, including his divine power. Does that make sense? We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who is called to us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises Supplement your faith. Now watch these building blocks here. Provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brother, brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for who? Everyone. Can I just say this? I'm not there yet. You know about my troubles with the dog. Not there yet. By the way, can I tell you another dog story? Now, this just gets me. 
Uh, yesterday was a hard day. Some of you may see my daughter's post. I, my cat of 17 years, we had to put her down. And I got to hold her while they, while they put her down. And she was my buddy. But she was a difficult cat. She had been abused. And so she just wasn't very affectionate. Uh, it took years uh, of counseling to, to, really, to really help her. But do you know yesterday when I was holding her as they put her to sleep was the first time in nearly 17 years that I actually was able to hold her? Because she just, she just could not, be, you just couldn't touch her. You could pet her, but that's all. So she, we kind of became buddies. So it was kind of a hard day, and I get ready for bed, and uh, Michelle's already in bed. She's asleep, and we got this one light on, and I could just kind of barely see as I pull back the covers. And guess who's laying next to Michelle, under the covers, head on the pillow, with like one paw behind her head, like a human being? <laughs> Just pray for me, okay? <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, okay, we're going to move on from that, all right? So you can see there's incredible power that's available to you, incredible blessings. You know, if you were to read the book of Ephesians, specifically Ephesians chapter 1, just read Ephesians chapter 1. See what Paul says. Paul's so excited, it's the longest run-on sentence. Verses 3 through 12 are like one giant run-on sentence. He's so excited, and he's worshiping the Lord, and he makes this one amazing statement. He says, you have been seated with Christ and been given every spiritual blessing. I want to know what that's really like. I have not experienced that to the fullest because for too many years I walked in unforgiveness and thus have limited God's ability to work in my life. I want to know what all of his blessings are like. You? You don't sound like it. I'm going to keep working on you. I'm going to keep jabbing you. All right? Now, this is important. This is so important. Forgiveness is not excusing someone's wrong or bad behavior. Some people think that. They're like, oh, if I forgive them, they're going to get away with stuff. No, 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 no. This is what June was teaching, and this is what I want to teach. You take them off your hook and put them on God's. You hearing me? Take them off your hook and put them on God's. In fact, let me, um, I was still working on this message this morning at about six this morning. Can I add a verse here? All right, let me go, let me go out of this and let me look this up. Yeah, let's go to 1 John. We're loving the Johns today. 1 John 2.11. If you're there before me, you'll know why I'm going here all of a sudden. 1 John 2.11. I love this. Is that the right verse? Yeah. There you are. Yep. But anyone, now watch this, who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. Now, Catch that first statement. Anyone who hates a fellow believer. So this is a believer on believer situation. So if you're here today and you're hating on your brother, you're living in darkness, which is the same as an unbeliever. So you cannot expect God's fullest blessings. And didn't I give you a verse just a couple weeks ago? Mm, Didn't it say if you don't forgive others their sins, God can't? That sounded terrible. You mumbled that. If you don't forgive others their sins, God can't. I know this isn't easy stuff, but there's a reason Jesus went to the cross. And this is one of them. Amen? All right, jump over to Hebrews chapter 12. I just want you to see this. Kind of where we're going to close out. I love this word, Ephesus, Greek word. It means to pardon or cancel. How many of you love and enjoy the fact that your sins have been canceled? Amen. Amen. We want that for everyone, especially those who are hurting. 
who don't know what they're doing. We want them to understand what they are doing and get healing. All right? Let's go over to Hebrews. You know, there's a coffee place called Hebrews. I think one of the churches around here has it. What did I say? Hebrews 12, 6? Yep. You know, I'm going to back up. I'm going to go to verse 1, start at verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, or to a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily tripped us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on who? The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. You don't think for a minute that if God doesn't discipline you, he isn't going to punish the wicked and the ungodly and those who did ungodly things to you. Deuteronomy 32, 35, you don't have to turn there, I know it. It says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's mine, not yours. That's what it means to take people off your hook and put it on God's. You want to do that today? All right, let me start that over again, because this is a really exciting moment. Here, I'll, I'll just kind of jump out at you, you know, and just... Do you want to do that today? Yeah. I mean, that's really what you want to do. You want to walk out here with that burden off you. Trust. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, of things not seen. It's in the spiritual realm. I think I've said it before. Let me see. Um, uh, the supernatural drives the... Oh, you guys have learned that one, haven't you? That's a fill-in-the-blank every week. That's my weekly fill-in-the-blank, and I'm not going to let that up on that until you finally get that in here, okay? Everything around you is being driven by the supernatural. Why do you think we're called to know the Word and be in prayer? You're in a spiritual battle, and Satan loves for you to remain in unforgiveness. Remain in unforgiveness and bitterness and anger and all those things, and he can keep you from God's blessings. Even as a believer. That's called bondage. And we want to walk out of here free people today. And we can take a big step if you're willing to take it with me. Yes or no? Yes. All right, let me close on a life application and a story where I had to learn this. You want to hear my last story? All right. Many years ago when I was working in news, we hired a, or I should say, this young man had been hired when I was coming on board the station to help start this station up. And uh, his dad was the head of the TV station. He's the general manager. Seemed like a nice enough guy, kind of a laid back guy. He was one of our cameramen. He was married already. I think he was only 19 at the time, 19 or 20. Uh, married, I met his wife. His wife was very sweet. And about six months later, we hired a young girl. I say young because compared to how old I am now, it's young. But uh, she came on board, and it wasn't very long before we discovered they were having an affair. And they were in this adulterous relationship. And what was really hard was I was both of their bosses. What made it even worse was nobody could touch him because of who his dad was. And he knew that. And some of his good friends who had been in his wedding with him, with his first wife, who he was still married to, pulled him aside and said, you're living in adultery. And this was his response. So what? Maybe I am. What are you going to do about it? That's a great response from a fellow believer. So what? Doesn't matter. And can I just say this? With every passing day, they got more arrogant, more cocky about everything. 
because they knew they couldn't be touched. Me, every day that passed, I got angrier and angrier. I just wanted to punch him. I'd give him an assignment, he'd mouth off to me. She would be arrogant about the stories I assigned, and man, I was getting mad. I mean, I was getting really mad. I was seeking vengeance. I wanted to get even. Yes, that was your pastor at one time. Well, something happened that we thought saved the day. They both got jobs at another TV station. It was over in Indiana. <laughs> so we thought, good, that'll be at a distance. Problem solved, right? Well, in that time, Michelle and I had gotten married. We had our first baby, Rachel. And we had a baby shower, and Michelle got all, we got all kinds of nice gifts. And one day, this package comes in the mail, and it's from that couple. I thought, oh, I got my daughter a gift. All right, I'll open it up. Open it up. It's a very nice outfit with a letter inside. I open up that letter, and it's one of the nastiest letters I've ever received. And in that letter, they accused me of all kinds of things, not being supportive of their relationship because they did go and get married and you know, he divorced his first wife with no biblical grounds whatsoever, gets married, right? Wants us to come to the wedding. I'm like, mm-mm, not going. They were, they were furious about that. So he let me know with all kinds of words and expletives and what they thought of us and all that, and I was, I, I was just absolutely furious. I want to get on the phone with him and just tell him everything I thought of him. I had to just get it out, right? Well, I went to his best friend, who was still working it with us, and I said, hey, uh, your, your ex-best friend here, uh, here's the letter, and I let him read the letter, and I said, what do you think I ought to do about that? He goes, let it go. I'm like, what? Let it go. Look at all he said. Look at all the crap he says in that letter. He goes, Tom, he doesn't know what he's doing. And he said, God will take care of that situation. I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, all right, man. I said, I'm not sure I'm in agreement with you. I don't know how far, far away or how long it was. Uh, we went to church one Sunday, and it just so happened that couple had used to be in our church before they left. Well, they came back to visit one Sunday. And I saw them, and man, as soon as I saw them walk through the door, man, they were just sauntering through there. I think they wanted people to see. You know, it was kind of like that. Man, I saw them. I leaned over to Michelle. I said, man, I can't stand them. I said, who do they think they are. They shouldn't even be here. I'm going to tell them. And then the pastor gets up and begins to preach on forgiveness. <laughs> and he says these words. Don't forget those who don't know what they're doing. Let him go. And I'm like, I got to forgive these people. I got to let it go. I don't want to, but God has spoken. And I asked the Lord for forgiveness. And it was pretty cool because about two years later, Michelle and I had to go to a wedding and guess who showed up? And guess where they were seated? Right across from us. I had a fork and a knife and I wanted to use it. <laughs> and I looked across from them and I could look them in the eye without any anger. And let them go. Because I was able to take them off my hook and put them on God's. You know how I know that? Because in that church service... When that preacher was talking and I was seething with anger, the Holy Spirit actually spoke to me, and this is what he said. They're my responsibility, not yours. Do you know how many times Michelle has had to say that to God? Go oh, good, you guys didn't catch that joke. It was a reference to me. <laughs> you want to walk out free today? All right, before I pray for you, 
I want you to watch just a little video. Pay a close attention to what is said in this video, and then we're going to pray together. Jesus knows exactly what you've gone through because he went through it first himself. Can we pray together? And here's what I want you to do if you're willing to do it. I want you to fix yourself, fix your mind on either the circumstances or the people that you need to take off your hook. And once you do, let them go and let God do what he needs to do in this situation. Remember, your goal is freedom, not revenge. Okay? And this is true for us, me as well as it is for you. I'm no different. And if Jesus was willing to do it, then I as your pastor have to be willing to do it too. You ready? Let's so bow our heads. And this is going to, we're not going to make this hard. Here's all I want you to say. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lord Jesus, I take them off my hook today and I make you Lord of their lives. Forgive me, Lord. And let me walk out in your true light, no longer under the burden of unforgiveness. I give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everyone together said...